Hi everyone, welcome to National Arbor at the Gaylord near Washington DC for Sea Airspace 2021. This is our first show in the US since January 2020. I can't wait to get inside to check out the new systems on display. Let's get inside and check it out. The Old Star booth has a lot of interesting new models on display here at Sierra Space 2021. To discuss them, I'm with Larry Ryder. Larry, good morning. Good morning. Thanks for stopping by. Thank you. You're the vice president here at Allstall. Can you first start with the law, Light Amphibious uh, Warship? What can you tell us about it? Yeah, so the, uh, the Light Amphibious Warship is a program we're, we're pretty focused on. It's, uh, you know, it's part of the, the yards changing. We're going to be building steel here shortly. April will be uh, open for business to, uh, to start cutting steel. The, um, the law program fits in nicely with that in terms of the schedule and the size of the ship. Uh, and also the numbers the Navy's looking to go to, you know, really favor serial production and certainly that's a strength for the Austell shipyard. So uh, it's a program we've been pretty excited about. We, um, we've been working small studies for the Navy for, uh, for several months and now we're part of the, uh, the uh, concept study, uh, one of those teams. And, uh, you know, we've evolved the design pretty significantly over the last year or so to to meet the Navy's requirements, and uh, we think we have a, a winning design. What are the main features of your design? Well, the um, you know I, I think starting with the uh, up forward at the bow, it's uh, we, we meet the Navy's uh, beaching requirement. You know the the gradient beach gradient was one of the primary design drivers, so we think we've got a, um, a design that that meets that and maintains maneuverability and stability. Um, we've got the survivability features that uh, the Navy and Marine Corps are looking, the, the habitability features, um, and I think we also have margins to, uh, to meet future requirements. So I, I think it's a good solid solution based on a proven hull design, so I think it's low risk. And um, you know, you combine that with our ability to ramp up production. Can you please share some specifications with us? Yeah, so the, uh, the law design where it stands right now, we've, uh, we've adjusted it several times to, uh, to meet the Navy's evolving requirements. Right now our solution is about 120 meters long, uh, about 4,500 tons displacement uh, with, a, um, with a mission deck space of about 10,000, 10,500 square feet for rolling stock or cargo. I see a number of weapon systems on board, which is quite unusual for that type of uh, amphibious ships. Uh, is this part of the requirement? Yes, the uh, the Navy and Marine Corps have um, added significant, um, you know, self-defense capability, and that's one of the requirements we've been uh, working to meet. Um, you know, again, we, we have the margin and the payload to accommodate wherever the uh, the Navy uh, ends up on the requirements. Right now, we're responding to the to the GFE requirements. Uh, is this uh, an EPF configured to conduct hospital missions, hospital ships missions? Well, actually, this is a, um, a clean sheet design. It, it's a 118 meter, 118 meter catamaran, so it's bigger than the current EPF. It uh, has a redesigned hull form, so it gives you a little better capability in sea states, but we still retain the high speed, shallow draft, the, the accessibility. But as you can see, it's painted out like a hospital ship because it, it is a hospital ship. It, uh, it basically takes all the capabilities that you have on the current TAHs, the comfort and the mercy, puts it in a smaller package so you don't have the same capacity, but you have all those same capabilities in a much more responsive and, and agile platform. So that's kind of the concept we took. We took the best of the, uh, you know, the EPF concept um, and put it into a bigger platform. We started with a clean sheet um, so that you have a ship that's really optimized to do the medical support mission. So it's a brand new design, but is it a program of record yet? It is not a program of record. It's a design we've been working, we've, we've discussed with the Navy on several time, or occasions. Uh, it, it was really something that uh, people were looking at hard uh, during the COVID response last summer. 
when um, you, know, you had the challenges of getting comfort and mercy on station. Um, so th this design actually predated that, but last summer we put a lot of engineering effort into uh, really updating the design based on lessons learned. Um, we hope it becomes a program design. We think it's a great solution for the Navy. Um, it, it's an economical solution. The, um, you know, and, and the fact is the comfort and mercy really at the end of their service life and uh, I'm not sure they're you know, economically viable platforms anymore. So. How many ships, uh, for how many ships would be the requirement here in the U.S., do you believe? Yeah, so we, we've looked at it and run some numbers, you know, just from the industry perspective, and, and we think a fleet of six to eight distributed globally would, would give you the ability to mass three uh, medical ships within 72 hours uh, in just about any area of interest. So you'd have a, a distributed, you know, six ships distributed globally to respond to smaller scale events within a day. Um, but then you'd also have the ability using their speed to mass them if, if you had a, uh, you know, a need in the Western Pacific, for instance, to, uh, to support a, uh, you know, a larger engagement. Um, and, and looking at where the Navy and Marine Corps are headed with distributed maritime ops, smaller, more distributed platforms, you know, I, I don't think it makes sense to have one big you know, thousand bed facility rather than two or three ships spread out and really supporting the forces. Um, and then the other advantage is with a small crew, you can keep the ships operational, you know, full time instead of reduced status. You fly medical debt out and you can do engagement activities and, and really get to these smaller countries and smaller ports that aren't used to seeing a U.S. presence and really up your, you know, the, the quality of the uh, engagement we're doing as part of the um, theater cooperation program. So it's, it's, I think it's got a lot of advantages. Um, you know, the final number would certainly be up to the Navy, but six to eight, I think, really gives you great capability and, uh, you know, it's cheaper than replacing one for one with the, uh, the current hospital ship. What new design did you unveil this morning at uh, Sierra Space 2021? Well, this is the uh, U.S. Coast Guard's uh, first icebreaker in about 40 years. Uh, Halter was successful in, in winning the competition several years ago. Um, we've taken the best of the best of uh, all the suppliers around the world and integrated into this uh, multi-mission craft for the U.S. Coast Guard. We're quite proud of it. Um, we're uh, continuing through the spiral design phase now. Uh, we'll be starting construction very soon and uh, look forward to having this, this uh, vessel in the water and uh, moving toward our mission in the future. Uh, where is the yard located? Where will the ship be built? The shipyard's located in uh, Pascagoula, Mississippi. We're on uh, Bioca site, which is a little east of the city, a um, little bit further east of Engel Ship Building. Um, we employ uh, nearly a thousand people, and once we're, uh, we're under contract for one of the vessels with options of two more, and so in the coming years we'll be ramping up uh, almost double in workforce to build this particular class of vessel. Polar security cutter is uh, t going to be approximately 22,000 tons. Uh, she has uh, requirements to be able to go operate all the way in the Antarctic as well as the Arctic and to very heavy ice, break ice, and be able to resupply the McMurdo science station that's down there in the Antarctic. Uh, that requires a vessel that has very unique and very powerful capability. It's got almost uh, 45,000 horsepower uh, in three different uh, propulsors, uh, two of which are rotating azipods and one's a centerline shaft. And uh, her crew uh, will deploy literally traveling from her home port uh, all the way down to the Antarctic. Uh, so she needs to have a long range as well as when she gets on scene to be able to break that heavy ice. So she operates uh, crossing the equator in water that's almost 90 degrees and then water that's 28 degrees. So she has a range of operations, really a challenging engineering uh, design to be able to make the ship be able to do its own missions. And it is a multi-mission uh, platform. It doesn't just break ice, it does several other Coast Guard missions uh, to support uh, the overall Coast Guard program and, and support our nation uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, its, in its execution of its missions. Uh, and if you look at the model, you can see it has helicopter uh, capabilities. 
uh, and it has science capabilities to be able to conduct scientific uh, 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 testing analysis uh, in those regions, which uh, uh, contributes to the body of knowledge uh, of the whole world, really, of, of the, the very cold environment that the Polar Security Cutter operates in. Um, but uh, Halter Marine's excited to be part of it. It's a unique opportunity. Again, first time this ship of this type has been built in uh, four and a half, almost five decades. And uh, uh, we've got our designers progressing. We'll be starting construction in the new year. And uh, we're excited. Can you tell us a little bit about LAW? Yes, uh, LAW is the light amphibious warship. Um, it's, uh, it's a uh, multi-mission craft that uh, we're in a study phase at the moment. We were just awarded the study along with six other uh, potential offers. Um, we're offering our one of our parent crafts uh, and L LSV as our offering for this particular variant. Um, we're, we're building two of that similar class right now. Um, and we're in discussions to build two more. And of course, looking at the schedule, the law will come right in behind that. So we're, we're in a good, a good position to uh, both have a good um, offering that is fully compliant with the Navy and Marine Corps requirements, but also have a hot production line that will enable us to move straight in and produce the vessels. All right, Bob, thank you very much. Yes, sir. My pleasure. All right, Ty, you are showcasing this uh, guided rocket for the very first time. It's an LIG Next One uh, product from South Korea. Yes. Why are you showcasing it here on your booth at CR Space 2021? So uh, back in 2018, Raytheon and LIG started working together to bring this system to the United States and to the DoD forces, uh, specifically the Navy, Army, and SOCOM, and, and the Marines. And so we are now in the process of formalizing the relationship. And so we decided as together to present this as a new system for specifically the Navy for this show. For which type of scenario, which type of target is this uh, designed to, to attack, to address? So there's a lot of capability in this missile, but the primary one is a counter FIAC, so counter small boat, boat swarming type targets. Um, there's a need specifically in the Pacific and the Middle East and other locations for that capability. And the, the U.S. Navy specifically has um, requirements for that that they have not filled yet today. And here at the show uh, on the outside exhibit at the dock, there's a USV fitted with a launcher for this type of rockets? Yes, absolutely. So uh, Textron has their CUSV unmanned service vessel out in the water for the show. Uh, we've been working, LIG, Raytheon, and Textron work together to bring that log IR or K log IR launcher to the show and have it integrated on the CUSV to show the Navy and other customers the maturity of this capability. What's the benefits of integrating uh, this system on unmanned systems? Well, the, the biggest benefit is twofold. Self-defense, this is a short-range missile, fire and forget, uh, so this allows those smaller v vessels to protect themselves. But also on the offensive side, be able to bring those unmanned service vessels to the flanks of a threat and be able to attack them um, without being seen or with a very low signature while the enemy potentially is going after larger ships. What's next for Raytheon as far as this is concerned? Are you going to demonstrate it to the Navy? So we're in the process of talking to the Navy and talking to other customers to, to do a, conduct a demonstration. Um, there were still formal talks, uh, but that is the goal, is to go and demonstrate this capability on a CUSV in a unmanned, a, a, a full up demonstration for the US Navy. All right, Ty, thank you very much. No, appreciate that. Thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you. For the first time here at Sierra Space is the cell drone. Look at the size of this USB. Wow, let's go check it out. This is a full size of our Explorer sail drone, which is an unmanned surface vehicle uh, that is primarily propelled by wind and powered by solar and hydro generators. Uh, to do ocean data, uh, ocean mapping, and maritime domain awareness. We've been working this project for about seven or eight years now. Uh, the concept came from our founder, who actually has the world record for a land yacht, 
and the technology of his wing system is what is now what you see behind us uh, to propel this uh, USV. Can you share with us some uh, specification, uh, technical specs, and uh, as well as performances for the cell drone? Sure. So the Explorer class that's behind me is 23 feet or 7 meters long. Um, endurance is up to 12 months at sea. Uh, we've done over 500,000 miles at sea and 13,000 days at sea, so it's a very proven platform. Um, we also have a large USV called the Surveyor, which is 72 feet or 22 meters long that does full ocean mapping um, and can do shallow water mapping as well. And we're prototyping a, a mid-sized drone uh, that is 10 meters or 30 feet long uh, that will do the maritime domain awareness mission as well as shallow water uh, ocean mapping. Has the U.S. Navy or U.S. Coast Guard evaluated the sail drone? Yes, we've demonstrated the capability of the sail drone a number of times uh, for different missions to both the Coast Guard and to the Navy, as well as other defense and government customers. And, uh, can you tell us more about the typical missions the sail drone can conduct for defense customers? Right, for defense, we can do everything from uh, ocean data collection, which helps with acoustics or weather forecasting, um, to maritime domain awareness, which allows us to use our radar um, and our camera system with a, a proprietary machine learning system we developed to identify and classify objects that are on or above the water and report those back. So if you think about that scenario from a uh, border uh, security or a port security role um, or in a distributed maritime operations role, um, out looking for targets that maybe aren't broadcasting their AIS um, but can be seen via radar or visual. And then finally, for ocean mapping, uh, certainly safety of navigation is a huge piece of that for both surface ships and submarines, uh, collecting data that allows them uh, to know the ocean and to be able to have that maneuver room uh, while they're out there. All right, Brian, thank you very much. Uh, thank you.